please feel free to enter into a live chat, which is that bar underneath the channel, the video you're seeing now. And as I'm talking, feel free to write your comments or questions, especially questions in there, and I will address those questions at the end. So hopefully that will work a little bit better. I know there's a little bit of a delay. So if I wait for you to enter uh, comments or questions at the end, I lose my patience and then we get no questions. I want to address a question that was raised after last talk on the priesthood uh, and answer that question. The question was, why do we call the Catholic priest father? Where does that come from? And it comes from the nature of uh, the relationship, the spiritual relationship that the priest has with his people. Um, in the scriptures, St. Paul, and I forgot to look it up again in the epistles, one of the epistles, St. Paul began the practice by asking his fa fellow Christians to call him Father, because, uh, and I quote, I have begotten you in the ways of faith. And so, end of quote. So, uh, St. Paul already began, and the tradition of the church uh, kind of started where out of respect for the reality which is uh, the life of faith which is uh, given and offered by the priest to the people especially through the sacrament of baptism uh, the priest kind of generates new life spiritual life the child is reborn to a relationship with god born anew through baptism so in that way we rightly say that the priest is a spiritual father. I know some people quote scripture where it says, call no one on earth your father. But that same passage continues by saying, and call no one on earth your teacher, for you have one teacher in heaven, God. And so, yes, Jesus did say those words, but he said them, uh, we have to understand the context uh, Jesus was uh, identifying that the true teacher, there's only one true teacher, and there's only one true Father, our God in heaven. And so we participate in God's gift of fatherhood and as a teacher, if we teach in the name of Jesus, if we father in the name of Jesus. And so um we know that it's our practice in the world to call our teachers and school teachers still, to call our biological father's father, even though Jesus said those words. So clearly, uh, it wasn't intended literally and exclusively, uh, but simply as a, as a lesson to understand that all fatherhood and all authority is given to us uh, by God himself, who is the ultimate authority. So that's uh, how I would like to address that issue. So we begin lesson number 14 in the second section of the Catechism of the Catholic Church entitled How We Worship. We are talking about the sacraments and today we speak about the second sacrament in the sacraments of ministry. So the title of this talk is uh, 14 We Worship sacraments of ministry number two there are two sacraments of ministry that the church identifies in the catechism of the catholic church the first one is uh, holy orders or priesthood and we spoke about that last week and the second one is holy matrimony or marriage notice that both have the word the qualifier holy in front of it and that's because both the priesthood and matrimony as well as all the sacraments of the church have one purpose and that purpose is to bring us closer to god to make us holy more like god so uh, rightly we say all the gifts all the sacraments that jesus gives us through which we receive the grace of god the presence of god in our lives lead us to holiness, are meant to lead us to holiness. And therefore, since they are agents of holiness, they are called holy sacraments. 
holy priesthood or holy orders and holy matrimony. Okay, so the Catholic Church's understanding of matrimony, holy matrimony, or the sacrament of matrimony is as follows. And I'll just read a short definition of what holy matrimony is in the Catechism. A covenant by which a man and a woman establish between themselves a partnership of the whole of life, ordered towards the good of the spouses and procreation and education of offspring. End of quote. So that's the <clears throat> given definition in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I'd like to focus on two things in that definition, and that'll be the entire talk on the sacrament of marriage. I want to focus on marriage as a covenant. What does, does it mean that marriage is a covenant? And then at the end, I want to focus on the two purposes of marriage that are listed in this definition. For the good of the spouses, reason number one, to get married, for the good of the spouses, and reason number two, for procreation and education of offspring. So, but first let's talk about the covenant. As you know, and you'll know it so well by the end of this course, I keep going back to this principle, which is essential, that we may are made in the image and likeness of God to understand ourselves and the world we live in and how we are called to live and function we have to understand God. How God is, we are called to be. How God interacts, we are called to interact. What God does, we are called to do. And so, if marriage is a covenant, that means that there is something in God that is a covenant or is covenantal. First, a distinction, a covenant versus a contract. A covenant is an arrangement between two parties, two parties, two groups or two peoples, which is um, permanent. It involves the sharing of life and persons. It is faithful no matter what, and it is loving. It's focused on the good of the other rather than just my own good. That's a covenant. In contrast to it, a contract is a temporary, time-limited uh, commitment between where the sharing of goods is involved rather than the sharing of persons. In a contract, think of a contract you make with, uh, with a telephone company. A contract is about uh, making an arrangement to share certain services or goods. It has a temporary timeline. It is focused on my own good, my own benefit, and it can be dissolved quite easily when one or the other party involved in making and writing up of the contract doesn't fulfill his or her um, side of the requirements of the contract. Why do I make the distinction between the covenant and the contract? Because God continues to make a covenant with his people. And we continue to slide into making contracts with one another. And that's where the greatest challenge is when it comes to our existence in this world and also marriage. Instead of entering into covenants, we are entering into contracts. That's part of our sinfulness. We think about what's in it for me. What's the best deal I can get out of this relationship for me? We can even approach our relationship with God as a contract. So what are you going to give me? And what's the minimum I have to do in order to keep my side of the deal so that I get as much as possible out of it? The answer to our woes in all of our relationships, our relationship with God and our relationship with one another, is to 
to turn away from making contracts and functioning as if we are in a contractual relationship with people and with God and turning towards a covenant mentality that we are in a covenant with God and we are called to be in a covenant with one another and even with the created world. Covenant is essential. How do we know that? Because that's how God chooses to enter into a relationship with us. From the very beginning, God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve. After the fall, there is a covenant that they will not die, that God will not lead them, let them be destroyed, that God will send a, a Savior. Right in the book of Genesis, the first covenant is made with Adam and Eve. Then the second covenant is made with Noah. Then another covenant is made with Abraham, another one with Moses. And then ultimately the last covenant is made by Jesus with his church. So God's relationship with us is a covenantal relationship. And, and, and so what, what does that mean? That means that all the elements of a covenant are present in the way God relates to us. So that means uh, God will always be faithful, even if we are unfaithful. God will always be our Father, our God. We are called to be God's people. But even if we turn away, even if we reject God, God will not reject us. God will never break his promises. It is permanent. He's always keeping his side of the promise. It's not dependent on our faithfulness to him. God's faithfulness to us is not dependent on our faithfulness to him. Uh, so, God's covenant is life-giving. In other words, God wants us to actually grow and improve through a relationship with him. Not simply to get what, what, you know, the minimum that is required. So, all those elements are very important in our understanding of how we are called to be with God, with one another, and also in the sacrament of marriage. Marriage is a covenant. So what does that mean? It means that I am entering into a relationship that is, that, that is identified, defined by God, created by God. Marriage is a creation of God. It is not a man-made, human-made uh, institution. We believe as Catholics that marriage is an institution created by God himself and defined by God himself. And it begins with Adam and Eve in the garden. God made a helpmate for Adam. She was to be his equal. They, were, they would look at each other's nakedness and they were not ashamed. They walked with God in friendship and conversed with him as with a friend. All of those elements, the peace, the love, the, uh, the service uh, to one another, uh, lack of shame with, before one another, friendship with God, all those elements were actual elements of a marriage that God establishes. Those, the most intimate relationship between a man and a woman. There is something beautiful about that establishing of that relationship because God, in creating humanity, uh, creates us male and female. And there is something that males have, even beyond biology, that females do not. And there is something that females have, even beyond biology, that males do not. And there is a complementarity between male and female. In other words, they need one another. Men and women need one another. In order for a man to be complete, he needs the gift of a woman. And for a woman, she needs the gift of a man. 
Now, that doesn't only mean exclusively, exclusively within marriage, but in general, men and women need each other because that's how God created us. And so, uh, in the sacrament of marriage, we call it a sacrament, but originally we would say that God created marriage as an institution with Adam and Eve, and slowly that institution continued to be blessed by God at times with um, difficulties, with concessions. Moses, for example, had to make concessions in allowing people to divorce or to have multiple marriages, uh, even for some men to have multiple wives. All of those were concessions. How do we know that? By concessions, I mean that's not what God wanted. But God kind of was almost, you could say, was getting tired and say, okay, I'll go with it, even though it's not what it's not the best thing for you. We know they were concessions because Jesus says so. He says, when the Pharisees and Sadducees asked Jesus about divorce, Jesus said, yes, Moses allowed divorce on the ground of porneia, is the word actually used in Greek, which is often translating uh, adultery, but it was also actually the word associated with marrying within close family relationships, invalid marriages. And so Jesus says, yes, Moses did allow divorce, but because of your hardness of heart, he allowed it. Not because it was good for you, but because your hearts were so hardened, he basically allowed it because it was the lesser evil. Uh, but, Jesus continues, that was not the way from the beginning. A man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. In giving that answer, Jesus, ans Jesus resolved the issue of divorce, said, when you marry, then God is bringing you two together. It is the act of God. And if it's the act of God, then you cannot undo it. What God has bound together, only God can loosen. You yourselves cannot do it. So God, actually, Jesus actually uh, forbade divorce in his own teachings. But so, so the understanding of marriage as a covenant, it comes from our understanding of our whole being as Christians, as covenantal people, that unless we begin to look at our relationships as covenants with God and with one another, we will never get past our own selfishness, our own neediness, our own desire to just get the best deal out of everything for myself. As long as it works, fine. But if you cross me, it's over. This happens within marriage in our day and age. But this it's, it's not just because of marriage, because we have allowed it to happen in our other relationships. We've allowed this uh, contract mentality to enter into our relationship or shape our relationship with God. So God, give me what I want, what I need, or else, or else, it's over. I'm walking. I'm doing something else. Or even with one another, right? Instead of saying, I will be kind to you unconditionally. I will love my neighbor unconditionally. What does that mean? That means that I will love the neighbor I like just as much as I will love the neighbor that I do not like or the one who is not nice to me. See, if we only show kindness and love to those who show it to us, Jesus says, then we are no better than the Pharisees. We are no better than pagans. We are no better than people who have no love and knowledge of God. So in our Christian life, if we are going to get marriage right, first we have to get our relationships right. And that means I have to know how am I going to enter into relationships 
with people and with God? Is my relationship going to be loving, unconditional, non-judgmental? Or is it going to be always focused on what's best for me? What's best for me? Now, within marriage, we believe as Catholics that Jesus took the uh, the institution of marriage, which already existed, and the tradition was teaching, the Jewish tradition, that it was originated by God himself with Adam and Eve. God gave us the institution of marriage and defined it as a union, covenantal union between one man and one woman. That's it. So outside of that, we cannot uh, redefine. If God gave us the definition of marriage, we cannot redefine it. We could only redefine it if marriage was not a covenantal relationship given to us by God, but if it was simply a human contract between individuals, then we can define it however we want. And that's what's been happening in the world. We have been The world has been trying to redefine marriage because they only see it as a contract between two people. And if it's a contract, you can break it, you can adjust it, you can change it, you can dissolve it, you can do whatever you want with it. But we are called to see it as a covenant, God-given covenant, God-defined covenant between one man and one woman. It is a covenant of love for two reasons. Why? So the, to answer the question why, the why of marriage, the church says marriage exists for two reasons. The good of the spouses and the procreation and education of offspring. So in other words, we call it for love and for life. Marriage exists for the sake of love and for the sake of life. Uh, love so that uh, I, I, I marry the other person because not because um, I'm in love. You know, that's, that's secondary. It's nice if it's there, of course, but it can't, the prim- can't be the primary reason. The primary reason has to be because I want to love. I choose to live the life of love that is unique with this individual. To love my spouse the way Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? By dying for all of us. Unto death he loved us, even to the point of death, death on the cross. Unconditional love of Jesus, asking nothing in return. Obviously, God asks us to follow him, but not as a something that is dependent on his love. He will love us even if we don't. But God wants us to experience his kind of love. And the only way to do that is to respond with love. So people enter, a man and a woman are called to enter into marriage for those two reasons. In order to love the other and experience the the joy and the blessing of love and also in order to uh, to share that love through life through creation through procreation the miracle of creating new life with the assistance of god's grace and sharing with that new life that child sharing the beauty of god and the call to holiness We call these two reasons for getting married, unitive and procreative. Or in other words, you think about love, the two commandments of love, to love God and to love my neighbor. In the unitive, so I get married because I want to share the kind of loving relationship with this one individual that will be uh, enriching for both of us. But I want to give my life for this person. For what purpose? So that I can grow in holiness and I can help this person to grow in holiness. At the end of this, the whole purpose of love is 
holiness. There is no other purpose associated with love. If the purpose of my love for the other is so that I can be satisfied, then that's called selfishness for my own benefit, for my own neediness. And we all have some of that, of course. But the ideal reason and the only reason for, for love is to experience holiness, which is the ultimate love of God. And marriage is supposed to assist those two people through the sacrament. It's supposed to assist them to become holy. They are supposed to assist one another in their pursuit of holiness through service uh, to the other person, through faithfulness to the other person, through forgiveness uh, when it's necessary, through commitment. All of these aspects, the virtue that is required to be to 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 keep the covenant I make with the other person, is is is. Uh, is an easy path to holiness. Uh, I always say, what if married people want to become saints, their pathway is simply to be faithful to the covenant of their marriage, and uh, and and that will that will move them to holiness. But there is also that whole business of procreation, openness to life. That is a necessary element of, uh, of marriage. And that's a miracle that God offers to us so that our relationship with each other, a husband and a wife, doesn't become so exclusive that no one else matters. Only we matter. You know, a relationship between two people can also become quite selfish and self-centered and self-seeking. And so there is generosity that is now also involved in that relationship. Generosity towards God in order to have children. As soon as you who are married, you know, as soon as children come into the world, it's a very costly gift we offer to God. We offer to the world of raising those children, of teaching those children, of being patient with those children. But that stretches our love beyond even my relationship with my spouse alone. It allows my love now not only to be a source of my holiness and union with God, but also my holiness and union with other people. Love God and love your neighbor. And so within marriage, those two purposes are also there. Why are, do you get married so that you can grow in your love of God and you can grow, grow in your love of neighbor. How do we do that? By loving your spouse, you grow to love God. If it's true love, if it's a true desire for love, which is desiring the good of the other for the benefit of the other, not just desiring something for me that the other person served me. And then there is with children and with openness to life. Obviously, even for those people who can't have children who are married, but if they are open to life, if they say, God, if you ask us to have children, if you, if you desire for us to have children, we are open and we will receive that and we will accept it and we will suffer through it in many ways and we will also be sanctified by it. Okay? So, uh, love and life, unitive and procreative, holiness and wholeness, all of that is part of the sacrament of marriage. Uh, I want to uh, just give you some practical, uh, uh, practical things, practical lessons at the end now, that within our Catholic tradition, marriage is so sacred that it is called a sacrament. And so very often I think people, um, people don't fully appreciate the holiness of their relationship that they have, that they have entered into. Sometimes we don't appreciate it through with our baptism, our relationship with God, how sacred and holy and life-giving that relationship is. We need to appreciate it in order to truly benefit from it. But also, for those who are married, that relationship is 
more holy and more sacred than we realize. And God comes to people who are married through their marriage, through their faithfulness in their marriage. So some practical things. In the Catholic Church, two people want to get married. They have to be a man and a woman. They have to be unmarried before because we do not accept divorce for reasons I've already explained. Um, there is a possibility if, uh, there, if, if there are such difficulties within marriage uh, that uh, have existed from the very beginning of that marriage and have not been able to be resolved, it makes it impossible to be together. It is possible every Catholic is permitted and even encouraged to question the validity of their marriage. Was it a valid and binding marriage from the beginning? And so the church can investigate, and sometimes you will hear of annulments or a de a declaration of nullity. All that means is simply that that marriage, which you were entered into, and it didn't work out for, for reasons that you present, uh, if the church establishes that from the very beginning there was something missing that was essential to making that covenant, and there was an impediment of some sorts, then that marriage can be called as an invalid marriage, which would mean that you never really entered into a binding and sacramental marriage, and so you are free to get married again, because that first marriage was not valid. Uh, once you enter into a valid marriage, and that marriage is consummated through an intimate sexual act, that marriage is permanent until death do us part. We believe in the permanence of marriage. We believe in faithfulness within marriage, that you are saying yes to this person and entering into a unique relationship that is only um, for that, uh, that union. And that that marriage needs to be open to life, to procreation. Those are the three ne necessities uh, within marriage. Uh, unity, we call it unity, indissolubility, and openness to life. Uh, how do we deal with remarriage or people who have been remarried? Um, obviously, in order to be validly married, one needs to be married in the Catholic Church by a Catholic priest uh, who witnesses the marriage. Uh, obviously, that applies only to Catholics. Non-Catholics don't have to follow Catholic uh, laws, but for Catholics, a marriage, in order to be valid, it needs to be in front of a priest and two witnesses in the Catholic Church. Um, and so if people uh, who are remarried outside, civilly, and so on, uh, we continue to minister to them and to love them and to encourage them and, and so on. But they are uh, not permitted to receive uh, the sacraments of confession and Eucharist uh, because they would be considered as living in an irregular uh, relationship with God and with, with their spouse. The last thing I want to say is the church has a beautiful um, name for uh, a family, uh, a family being meaning a marriage and the children, that the family is called the domestic church. It's called the domestic church because ultimately we have to remember the purpose of marriage as the same, the purpose of all sacraments is to bring us closer to God. And that can never be um, that, that, that should never be forgotten. Uh, everything we do, every relationship we enter into, ultimately is supposed to be um, a, an aid for us to grow in holiness, in wholeness, in faithfulness, in kindness. Ultimately, to grow in our relationship with God, a covenant with God, and proper relationship with other people, a covenantal relationship with other people. So that's it for our uh, lesson on marriage. Uh, look where we are. We are more than halfway through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So well done, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for this lesson number 14. 
I don't see any questions in the live chat, so I will assume that uh, there are no questions at this point. I wish you a good night and uh, we'll uh, talk to you next week. God bless.